Hey, um, we're back. I'm talking about the American D-Day book for Flames of War, V4. I'm here with Michael. Michael's the chief writer of the Flames of War book, um, American D-Day. And I kind of came in at the end and helped out a little bit at the end, but mainly about 99% of it's Michael's work. So we're here going to go over the um, questions you guys sent to us about the D-Day American book. Yeah, all right. Let's get start started. All right. Um, oh. For those who might not know, I'm Andrew Hot, and this is Michael Hot. We're brothers, so we um, we've known each other for quite a, quite a long time. Do we want to talk about the book at all for a few minutes before we jump into the questions? It's probably a good idea. So, um, do you want to give us a synopsis of the book? Yeah. So this is the first American book, uh, like a deep dive. So you've got the forces, you know, like your uh, Fortress Europe book, which kind of mm -hmm. gives you um, everything you need to know about fielding your mid-war forces in late war, sort of a sort of a feel. Mm -hmm. This is your first. Uh, hitting the beach. Um, the Americans have arrived in Normandy. That, that's the, the, the setting of this book. Uh, it's kind of set uh, from June 6th through to about August. So it's, it's that kind of those first few months in, in Northwest Europe. You know, whenever I think of a D-Day, I mean, Michael and I, when we first started playing, we played in the States before we even started working here. Our local store, we all just took a part of the beach landing and we created a giant table. Like I did point to Hawk and I created the beach and then created the rest of the table and everybody did that and we had this giant beach landing mm -hmm. event and that always sticks in my head but just how much fun that was just to play D-Day yeah. and kind of recapturing that idea with the missions and stuff that are in this book. It's quite cool to kind of just recapture that fun scenario play if you don't yeah know. normandy's always been really important um from uh from just a, a game club point of view it's it makes for a really fun uh campaign that people can kind of get involved in there's all yeah. the different beaches there's the different battles that happen right off the beach there's the airborne landings there's just so much that you can do and it means that a lot of different people in the club can find some sort of army that you know fits their style and things and yeah. they can they can get involved in a big project so that's kind of yeah a couple of years that was many years ago now it was over a decade yeah um, but <laughs> we um, but we've been playing normandy quite a bit and for a while you and i would get together and play omaha beach missions every june and kind of like celebrating this yeah. Yeah. and and so for you and i in particular it's always been a, a kind of close to to our gaming heart <laughs> so yeah the 29th so division i've had that army for so long yeah Beach landing, but so, yes. So it was really fun. So I was, um, was excited to get straight into, um, so go back to Normandy for uh, another another tour. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, let's get into some of these questions here. Um, Stuart asks, you know, why were the Americans chosen first as, a, as the first book of the Chung? Mm -hmm. And um, that one's kind of a, we had to choose one. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you ask both the Americans in the room, this is the one that we wanted the most, so this is the one we pushed for. But um, there were lots of voices. We thought about British and German and stuff like that, but it just, this was the one, I think, with the release schedule and everything else, just that it made the most sense for us. Yep. And so this is what we wanted. We knew that this was going to come on the heels of the uh, Fortress Europe. Yes. So um, Fortress Europe sets up any, any of the enemies for, the, for this book. Um, it sets up a lot of uh, basic forces that you know you're not going to miss out. Yeah. Um, straight away. So there'll be there'll be Germans to oppose you. There'll be uh, British to help you out. Um, and yeah, and it really was just a case of who do we start with. And the other thing is when you want to do D-Day, you want to do a D-Day battle. The British Rifle Company didn't change much on the assault step as as much as the Americans did. The Americans had a very unique beach landing approach with their units of yeah. infantry. Yeah. And so having them out now means you can actually reenact all the D-Day stuff and you're pretty close with most of the British stuff and most of the German stuff. Mm -hmm. And the Americans now you have access to those assault companies that would own and were uniquely made um, for the Yeah, exactly. The assault companies and, and a lot of the uh, paratroopers, things like that. Those yeah. are all things that we knew were gonna were gonna feature big in the Normandy stuff. So yeah. It's good to get them out first. But yeah. So hey, um is it Morton asks, um, how far does the book stretch period wise? From June to Market Garden in September question mark. Or mm -hmm. uh, will it be a focus on battles after Normandy like Paris, counterattack at uh, Morton or the um, the the Gap? No, Filet's Gap. Oh, Filet's yeah. Gap, sorry. Um, that's a really good question. It's, the book is really supposed to be uh, framed for, from a Normandy point of view. So the Normandy campaign starts obviously in, in June um, and kind of 
it ends at Falaise. It's kind of like the end point of it. Um, uh, the Americans had a small part to play in that, but they're, the way the Americans kind of cut their, cut off the Normandy campaign is with the liberation of Paris. So that's kind of how, when I was writing the book, all the forces, all the histories and stuff like that, they kind of all lead up to the liberation of Paris. There's a whole section after that where they go shooting off to the German border, which is the, um, uh, the British did it up north. They called it the Great Swan, but the Americans, they, yeah, there was just like a huge breakneck speed across um, France to, to the German border. Um, they didn't have hardly any time to re-equip or do anything like that because they were going so fast. And so, but when, they, when the Germans finally put a line in the stand uh, on, uh, at, the, at the border, that is kind of right around late August, early September. That's the Lorraine stuff. Yeah. So, um, so that's kind of like the cutoff I see. So like I kind of cut it off uh, around Paris and then, um, then all of that, the chase, um, there isn't really battles in the chase. So I kind of so somewhat ignore it. You can still use this stuff, it's fine. But um, yeah, the Lorraine stuff and everything beyond from about September on, you'll see in a, in a future book. Yeah, so the cut-up book kind of cuts it in American into two parts, and so the first part covers everything, and the second part will cover everything else beyond this book. And pretty much between the two of them, you can pretty much do every battle um, that is in between them. But yeah, so they, they do separate quite well, and um, I do think they're going to get a lot more toys and a lot different things in the next book. But this one, I think having this be just what it is now allows you to focus on the cool units from Normandy before we get into like Pershings and stuff like that in the future. Yeah, by the time the equipment catches up with the, <laughs> with the troops up in the front, um, yeah, they don't really need it until they get into battle. That, yeah. that doesn't happen until the end of the year. Yeah, exactly. Um, Lucas asks, um, where does Market Garden fit in? Oh, well, we just kind of went into that one. Yeah, so we, we just kind of covered it. I'll, just, I'll, I'll mention real quick though, that Market Garden, um, it kind of fits uneasily between those two um, gaps. But since it's mostly a British affair, you'll see a lot of the Market Garden stuff kind of come through in the British books. Yep. yep. Hey, Travis here. What is the difference between a para and glider infantry? Um, yeah, that's, there's, well, other, other than the, um, the fearless and confident ratings, which is quite traditional for Flames of War, we've always seen paratroopers as being ridiculously fearless because they like to jump out of uh, planes and and land in enemy territory and just kind of hold out till till the allies come. Uh, so they get the they get a fearless rating. They're quite well trained. Um, just as a quick point of reference, the um, and they're all volunteers. I should mention that um, because glider troops were not volunteers. So one day they were a rifle company. The next day they were told that they were going to still be a rifle company, but arrive on the battlefield in a wooden glider. Yeah, that's so <laughs> yeah so. so they didn't necessarily, they, they were, they were voluntold instead of being volunteers. So they were kind of a lot more, um, so they, they have more traditional American rating. So they'll be confident, uh, trained and, and they'll still be ag aggressive. And Gliding training was quite dangerous from what I've read about like actual taking off and just training, taking off and landing mm. are two incredibly dangerous parts of a glider's career mm. because they don't have the same level of intense training that paratroopers have and stuff like that dealing with you know, mm. situations that cry, cries of a wing flying off or something. Yeah, when you think about when you think about the, the a pilot who's flying a glider in, you're you're carrying a, a you know a half squad or a squad of guys uh, with you in in your via, in your aircraft. There's a lot of pressure on that guy to land nicely, yeah. <laughs> and if he can't, then uh, it's like all your eggs in a basket. You know, if a, if a glider goes down, you lose an entire platoon. So there's a lot of pressure there. And it's a super intense, um, like 10 seconds or whatever it was to yeah, land as well. Yeah. So it's it was it was an extremely scary affair. So the so so generally speaking, uh, your your paratroopers are fearless. Your glider guys are going to be confident because they're a little bit um, unsure about what they're about to do. But the uh, equipment wise, they're pretty. They're very. They're quite similar. But they have their own. They have their own uh, weaponry. So mm -hmm. like for example, the paratroopers have their own artillery. They have their own anti-tank guns. Um, yeah, the, the the infantry, the, sorry, the paratroopers are kind of ready to fight a war for as long as they can. So they've got a lot of a uh, lot of different stuff like in their formation. Yeah. Yeah. I know it's like in the book, they're actually borrowing a lot of things from the airborne, um, the glider company, mm -hmm. as in the the guns and stuff like that. Would 
glided in and they would grab them. Yep, some were, but like their artillery and things they could parachute. Artillery, yeah, yeah, that would. Yeah. Like you could parachute artillery and parachute in mortars, things like that. Oh, yeah. Yep. But yeah, formation wise, they look pretty similar. The thing I like about both of these is that they can get that second bazooka. So that makes them a little bit more defensive against tanks, which is mm. game wise quite, um, quite nice to have that. Yep, definitely. Um, <laughs> Wills um, asked Will there be a scenario for the Rangers storming Omaha Beach? I think you uh, might have a good answer for this one. Yeah, um, <laughs> there's two beach landing missions in the book um, Help Us on the Way and Fubar. Help Us on, on Its Way um, can also be translated into Point to Hawk, so if you want to do that, part of the ranger story you can. But on Omaha Beach, um, the same story kind of applies to the regular troops as it does the rangers. So really, um, it's just play the mission with rangers. Um, in fact, I did this in a battle report with Wayne. So you'll be able to see that on um, the website when that comes out. But yes, um, the rangers um, just used the FUBAR mission, which pretty much is a beach landing kind of gone a little bit wrong. Right? Yeah, it's gone sideways, so the, as the name implies. Um, yeah, so you've, in the old days, um, uh, the veterans among us will remember the old uh, Bloody Omaha mission. And that's just your standard hit the beach sort of mission. Uh, we've developed, um, and we'll get to this a little bit further on in the questions, but we've developed a few new missions um, that are like beach assault missions, but slightly different. Yeah. Uh, and FUBAR is basically, um, you get stalled on the beach. And you know, so rather than actually hitting the beach and your stuff just kind of arriving for the very first time, you actually start on the beach, and you still and you have to go even further than than before. So it's a it's a it's slightly more difficult than than the regular hit the beach with some with some changes. You get some yeah. um, you get some interesting. The attacker gets to go first, which is a huge yeah. change. I mean, being on that beach is like okay, let's yeah. go. oh wait a second. Well, that's a good point. Like um, in the in this case, because it's. Um, uh, oh, sorry, the defender normal, goes first. Sorry. Yeah, in this case, the defender is are, are the guys, um, uh, the um, the Germans. The Germans, the yeah. So they get to they get to go first. So in in the original uh, one, you're spending your first turns landing your your ships, and the guys come out and and they hit the beach, do some initial assaults. Uh, in this one, you start the game kind of like pinned down on the beach. So and. The Germans get the first turn, or the defenders get the first turn. So you get torn up and you have to recover from it. So it's kind of like an uphill struggle kind of thing, but you get you get some you get some help to, to, yeah, to overcome that. Maybe but, a political environment here and there. Yeah. <laughs> You'll see in our video that uh, my naval gun support came in very handy. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> let's go on to our next question here. So that was um, what was so um, Luke, Lucas asked, um, We've given an amazing amount of depth to the infantry list with command cards of ver for various divisions and such, um, but only a few for the armored divisions. Are you saving these for a bulge book? You know, what's up with that? Yeah, that was, yeah, that's exactly it. Um, there were a lot of infantry divisions involved in Normandy, so uh, I wanna, this was kind of their number one chance to get a bunch of, uh, get their time in the sun. Um, it, was, it was effectively a uh, infantry battle until they broke out and then it became a tank battle. Um, so there were lots and lots of divisions for the infantry, but there's only four divisions for the uh, for the armored guys um, initially. So initially there's actually only two, there's only the second and the, and the third. Yeah. Um, and then eventually the fourth and the uh, sixth come in and then later the fifth, so actually five. Um, but the there wasn't, there isn't the scope, I suppose, uh, of that when we get in to make a whole bunch of command cards for them. What we did instead for this book was we looked at the two types of divisions uh, and gave them, uh, and kind of split, split them up. So there's like a veteran version and a, and a fresh version. Yeah. So the fresh version is your kind of your confident trained uh, uh, model and your uh, veteran ones are the more veteran skilled. They can do more tactic stuff better. Um, that's, that's for the more, um, for the experienced second armor division and the uh, and the fourth armor division, which wasn't experienced but had go undergone some intense training in the U.S. So before it was even shipped out, the fourth division was seen as the most professional and the most um, ready uh, armor divisions, even amongst all of the ones that were going into Normandy. So they they basically that's why they kind of get like a leg up, and is is that they've had some intense amount of training in the U.S. So the fourth. So the fourth and the second are kind of grouped up in that veteran one, and the others are in the in the fresh divisions. But if you wanted to, eventually, when you get towards 
later in the war, there's a lot more armored divisions that show up, and that would be the point where I would where I would look at each division and give them a command card. Yeah. yeah. So the next book will probably be a lot more armored. Well, the Lorraine was one of the bigger American yeah. armored battles. Yeah. Yep. So that definitely makes sense. Yeah. Um, remember, because that's when we did and tank aces and all that stuff. Yeah, we focused right. on tanks. Then. That's right. Um, let's see here. So Frank asks, will there be Pacific train f available for the landings, missions, and etc.? Well, actually, there will be quite a bit of stuff that you can get. Um, you can direct order from us bunkers and beach landing boats that have like the troops and stuff inside of them. They look really cool, and then you can take them out when they like are beached on the la um, on the shore, but they haven't gone back. So they're quite fun that way. Um, there are going to be your machine gun nests and your bunkers and to book pits and stuff like that. So you pretty much will have anything you want in there. But on top of all that, um, we also are coming out with a really cool like cardboard train set that just has your a paper fold out beach mat. So you can just put it right on your beach mat. You'll have all the train for um, not only your um, beach landing stuff, but you'll have your airborne stuff in there as well. But you'll have your boats, you'll have your, your um, bunkers, you'll have your turrets and all that stuff. And the thing that's really nice about that, um, going back to like how we used to play every year is that you could put that into a small box, put it on your shelf, and then pull it out for the next anniversary, and it's just ready to go. It just it doesn't take very much space up, and really that's one of the biggest things about these D-Day tables. Because when we first started, we were making barbed wire, we were doing all these things. Barbed wire is now an easy token they can throw down on the table. Mm -hmm. So the games are just really easy to do. You can still model the barbed wire if you want, and you can do some really cool stuff. But if you just want a game, and you just want to play D-Day, you can just grab that kit and go, and it's very relatively cheap to buy as well. So that's also quite nice. So yes. Well, that's got ships. It's got landing craft. It's got airborne scatter stuff. It's got um, yeah. everything oh, basically. Even has your tokens from minefields and barbed wire. Yeah. And something I forgot to mention that was in there is all the bunkers have cards in there. So normally the only place you can get your bunker stats are in the book, and they have your stuff here. So the American book has all your German bunker stats here. Mm -hmm. But you don't actually have cards for them. We don't have any other place to get them except now this kit. So when you buy the kit, you'll have all your cards for your bunkers as well, which just makes it easier to play. Mm -hmm. Cool. Right. Um, Ian asks, will the French partisans' activity be reflected? Command cards, etc. Will both the White Scout card and the Greyhound armored recon cards be available? Sure, yeah. The um, French partisans are near and dear to my heart. I'm, I've always loved doing French partisans, so they certainly got a command card. They got two. Um, there's two types, two varieties of French partisans. There was the uh, FTP, um, which are the communist partisans, and then there's the um, FFI, which are the uh, more traditional, um, regular French, free French partisans. So they both have a card in there, two different flavors of partisans. Uh, and you can, um, and basically what they do is they just convert your rifle platoon into a partisan platoon. So it right. just changes their, their ratings. Um, you, can, you can model them any way you want. There was, there was a lot of really interesting things that happened in Normandy. There was a, a French partisan unit that um, helped the Americans in Brittany. And they were kind of just kind of hanging out and confusing the, uh, the Germans. They were like kind of sitting there and making it look like they, there were more Americans there than there actually were. Mm -hmm. So what the Americans, they realized that the Germans were being fooled like this. So the Americans grabbed them and equipped them with American equip, uh, uniforms. So they, they gave them a bunch, they took their jackets off, they just gave them everything they possibly could. Because when the, when the Americans went into Brittany, there was actually not very many of them. There were like, the, this was the Rangers that did it. So their unit is quite small. And so, in order to look bigger, they dressed up the French <laughs> partisans, and, and and they just kind of the French partisans just kind of you know made it look like they were, they were surrounded. Um, and so you could yeah you know, so you can you can so that's kind of why I, I said go ahead and use your Americans as French partisans if you want. Um, the other thing that you can do is there was a there were a bunch of um, Russian soldiers that had been conscripted into the German army that at the first opportunity of the Americans showing up switch sides. And so there was a bunch of, of Germans that were uh, basically fighting as free French. So I'm uh, sorry, a bunch of Russians fighting as free French wearing German uniforms. <laughs> so you could even go so far as to grab some German figures, paint them up and make them your French partisans as well. That's pretty cool. Yeah. One of the things that they did just to make them distinct is that they went through and grabbed all of their uniforms and dyed them blue because the first thing they found was... Friendly fire? Yeah. 
they're getting nailed. So, um, so yeah, if you want to, you know, just give them like a slight blue hue or something like that. That's pretty cool. cool. But or mix them together because the other thing is, once the Americans started seeing that these Russians were um, using German equipment, they started trying to get them some American uniforms and stuff. So, I also like how the French Protestants they have those, that cool rule that they're already there. I think is what it's called mm -hmm. rule where they don't count towards your reserves. So if you bring them, they have to start on the table, and then it's like. You could actually, your opponent might freak out because you have all this stuff on the table, but the French partisans are not as well mm. equipped and stuff as the Americans. Well, equipped, yes, but not skill-wise and yeah. stuff. And so they're not as a threat, bigger threat as if they were just American yeah. core units there. But at the same time, you get that same feeling in the games, like, oh no, there's tons of them there. What am I yeah. going to do? And they're really good. Like they're, they're, they'll be cheap. Uh, and there'll be a cheap option for you to add on to your unit. Um, they really fit well f with the people they historically fought with. So you know, slip them in with some Rangers, slip them in with um, some US rifles, but they also fought side by side with American tanks and things like that. So yeah. they, they fit li literally anywhere in the American army. Yeah, yeah they're great in it. Mm. Quite oh, like to answer the second half of that question, mm -hmm. um, we definitely have a new Greyhound. Oh yes. Uh, so the Greyhound is, a Greyhound kit's really good. It's got a, um, uh, two options. You can do the Greyhound or you can do the M20 version, uh, which is for the uh, for the um, tank destroyers. So I'm pretty excited about that. It means that I'm going to upgrade all my uh, older kits to to the new one. Yeah, and along with the Greyhounds, we also have a really sweet new plastic Jeep kit. Oh, Jeep. So that recon unit is actually quite cool now. You get the the, uh, the Greyhound and the Jeeps, and so it's just a really nice set. And you have the nice crisp plastic Greyhound and Jeeps just right next to each other. I, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I quite, I quite like that. It makes putting your recon together a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. Easy. And in, the, in, in the book, um, the, your cavalry unit is a support option, but we, there's a command card that lets you take a full company of them too. Yes. So yes, you'll be able to do a whole company of Greyhounds, which is cool. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Garrett has a question. He asked, um, what are the options for free French? So. There's, there's, one, there's one more option. Um, so you have the Free French Partisans. There's two versions of them, mm -hmm. uh, which, is we, which we covered. Um, and I believe you, the, you can field them as a formation as well. I believe so too. Yeah. It's been a while um, since I worked on the cards. Yeah. <laughs> we haven't gotten the new cards in the office yet. But yeah, I believe there's a card for that. But the other way to field Free French is the second armored division. So um, there was a whole uh, French armored division in the, uh, the UK, and, they, and the Americans equipped them with Shermans and American half-tracks, American armor, and everything like that. So they look like an American unit. And so there's a unit card in the, um, or sorry, a, a command card in there, in there that lets you field your, your American tanks or your armored rifles as French. So, so was, was this where you trained guys or these were your veteran guys? I've rated them as veteran because right. um, they, they, they very much were. So the core of, their, of that unit had been fighting in Africa and uh, came up to um, uh, England before being reorganized into an armored division. So yeah, That's these great. guys are veterans. Yeah. Yeah. Right, okay, Tony, is there any plans to do the Southern Invasion Forces through the Mediterranean coast? There isn't any plans per se for as a separate book, but what I would recommend if you want to do uh, Operation Dragoon, which is what he's talking about here, um, Operation Dragoon units all came from Italy. So uh, what I would do is just grab your Fortress Europe book and and go from there. Um, there were there are paratroopers though. However, there were a few paratrooper units, um, in which case you would use this book uh, mm -hmm. to grab your late war paratroopers. Well, you and can actually run them as a support option or as an extra unit with your Fortress Europe stuff. So you can actually mix and match if you need to. Yeah. So, so there's no specific plan for it, but actually, if you have Fortress Europe, you've got everything you need to field a Dragoon force right now. Cool. All right. Craig asks, will there be a naval, or will there be naval artillery support? Um, they play such a key fun. I think I already spoiled that earlier. <laughs> yeah. um, yes, there is naval gun support. It's quite expensive, but it's worth every point you put into it. Um, I believe Wayne was cursing in every turn that I got it and kind of leapt up in joy the turn that I didn't get it. <laughs> but um, it's, it, So many spoilers. <laughs> it's so many spoilers, but it, it is quite good. Um, the thing that I like about the naval gun support is that it's okay in your regular units because every unit sh theoretically or normally should have access to it, but it's better in the units that they historically fought with. So can like you, your rangers in there. Can you talk about how it works? Because this, right. this is a departure from what we did originally with naval gun press parts. So um, t tell us about naval gun support 
and well, how it works. You have to use your company commander to spot for it. So you don't have a special unit to spot anymore. Any company commander can. It's a very American feel, though, to have your company commander spot for you. But um, if they are spot, um, before you spot, though, actually, I forgot about this. Before you spot, you have to roll to see if it comes in. Mm -hmm. Now, normally you roll, I believe it's a four plus. No, it's a five plus to roll to get it if you're any company. But it's a four plus if you're a ranger or a beach assault company. So the three on the two units that use it the most, it's a 50-50 roll. Um, and then once you get it in, you range it in just like any other artillery. And um, it drops the bombardment with, I believe, 85 firepower auto, which is quite, quite good, especially when your opponent's dug in. Because that's what you really care about is getting the infantry and the gun teams out. But it won't hurt um, bunkers and stuff if they have rules against artillery. But it is um, quite a good card. I think it's 12 points for the card, which when... I first thought that's a lot of points, but then you look at it, it's like that's what a 25 a pounder battery would cost, or a 105 battery costs around there as well. So you actually get an artillery battery that your opponent can't remove off the table. It has kind of an aircraft restriction of rolling the dice if you get it, but it's quite good when you do, and it can be quite. So it's, not a it's not guaranteed. No. Yeah. So I think. Um, you just happen to be really lucky against Wayne. Yeah. I think <laughs> we addressed a lot of the problems the old naval guns of Bart had. And we're in version four, we have a really nice version that does exactly what you want it to do without doing too much or too little. So it's, um, it's a pretty good, pretty good upgrade. Yeah, so it's definitely there. Yep, and worth putting that 12 points into your beach landing for us, tell you what. I, um, right, so that was Craig. Um, Atu, I think is how you pronounce that, um, says, which rule, uh, rule rewrite did you like the most? And where were the tactical or historical reasons for the change? Oh, what, sorry, what were the tactical right. or historical reasons for the change? Yeah, my, I, I had to think about this one for a little bit. Um, so generally speaking, there, there's a lot of, uh, Americans have some special rules. We can just take a quick moment to, to mention <laughs> those, but um, they have their, the normal American special rules. If you've been playing Flames of War lately with a more recent American um, book, uh, there, none of these will really stick out as super new to you, um, other than uh, perhaps the AOP, the Aerial Observation Post. So you'll probably, you know, the, it's, an air, it's an aircraft, it kind of flies in on a 3 plus instead of the usual 4 plus. Um, yeah, it's unarmed, that kind of thing. So it just, it's basically, it's like a spotter that can kind of hop around and, get, and can get shot down. So you, got to, you do have to be careful with it. Yeah, I think the only other um, rule that I see in here that might not be in common is the gigantic one for the... Big yeah. artillery pieces. Or for the M12s, yeah. M12s, yeah. yeah. That just means that you can't really um, uh, ambush with it. Yeah, nothing, but, nothing too unique here. Yeah, but what, what's, what I'm, I particularly, just to speak to the actual question, which one did I rewrite, which um, did I like the most, it's the, all, the, all of the mission rules around the beach assault itself mm -hmm. and the airborne assault. So there's, there's two sections at the very end of the book. There's one um, for airborne stuff, and that one comes with a mission called uh, Shot in the Dark. And what you do with that one is you, it's, it takes place at night, basically. Everything is at night. Um, and it's the classic, uh, just, you know, you're, the planes are getting shot at and, and are getting off course and your paratroopers are being scattered all over the battlefield. Yeah. And you have to try to consolidate your troops to try to capture an objective. That's basically what the mission is about. It's capturing that element of it. And um, when I was developing this one, I was developing a few other ones, which you'll see in future books. And the idea was that you'll have a collection of airborne assault missions. Yeah. So in the old days, there was really just one. We had like one airborne mission and one seaborne mission. And what I really wanted to do with these books, uh, kind, of go, kind of going back to the old Stalingrad, or the Stalingrad books that we did earlier, um, was I wanted to add a bunch of missions, a bunch of context for those people to be able yeah. to play. So there's a, so there's a variety of of specialist missions uh, in in these books. So a bunch of a bunch of uh, beach assaults, a bunch of airborne assaults, and then the rules themselves. Um, I've given them a nice uh, modernized. Um, I modernized them quite a bit. So uh, like a beach assault in the old days was a good you know, eight pages of rules. Now they're down to four, but with lots of diagrams and uh, Airborne Assault is, has a similar reduction. One thing that you did in here that I quite like, and we continue this in some of our other books, is you made a link campaign between your missions as well. Mm. So that lets you play, um, lets you kind of go through all the missions, as you can see here, 
as a, a small campaign in your group. So if you want a little bit more, you can play this plus the missions in the rule book and you get some cool campaign missions that it's like, yeah, there's also a campaign in here. Mm -hmm. This is like so much like different things you can do with this book, which is quite good. Yeah. Um, one of the rule changes that I quite like, um, apart from missions and stuff like that, because I quite love the missions, but um, is the way we kind of changed, we didn't change as much, but we kind of restructured how we did command cards. And our command cards for the American book are focused more on unit upgrades and equipment upgrades and things that were, that kind of just twist up your list and give you like, this is American infantry with a twist, or this is, um, you know, colon colors, or this is, you know, these kind of things that just give you a little extra. It's a little bit different from the um, mid-war ones where they felt kind of like power-ups sometimes where like your commander can re-roll something. You can do, um, you get this special ability on just your commander. It, this was more kind of a list building focus, I think. Yeah, I wanted to lean into that flavor for the Americans. The Americans had a lot of gadgets and uh, they, they, that they did like tank telephones and, and uh, bulldozer tanks and I mean the, the British do as well but the, the Americans kind of took it to another level and I wanted to kind of capture as much of that as I possibly could in the command cards which is why which is where you'll see a lot of kind of like you were saying more more tech and more kind of like uh, divisional uh, uh, character cards as opposed to those those kind and of power-ups yeah. i think that's kind of like with like the special rules question like what rules change stuff. i think the rules in the book are nice and simple and straightforward these are the american rules but that's where you get your kind of interesting rules and your extra flavor on those command cards and so you can kind of play around with you know i want an infantry company with smgs well there's a card for that you know things like that and so you can kind of go to that nth degree yeah, yeah. all right um let's see here so we did that one. Oh, we're done here. Okay, so the, um, Samuel asked, what is our favorite units from the new book? Um, do you want to start with that one? What's your... right. Well, we were, talk we were trying to decide last night. Yeah. We just went through the whole thing. Like, oh, I love this one. I love this one. I mean, 29th Infantry Division, um, Beach Landing is my, my list I've played since the very beginning. I love the, um, the Beach Landing troops, especially the 29th, the train guys. But um, in the new book, I'm actually quite interested in the new Stuart company. So we have brand new plastic Stuarts, and I'm just really jazzed about putting Stuarts together, having a whole army of Stuarts. And Michael will roll his eyes, but I love the M8 Scott as an artillery piece. It's a little 75 howitzer in a Stuart body. I just, I don't know what, what it is about it. I just love that tank. And the Stuarts can bring that as part of their formation, which is quite cool. So I'm definitely gonna put all, as many Stuarts as I can, the Scots in there, the mortars, because mortars and version four are quite, quite effective um, game-wise. But um, to add some firepower to my list, I can now add things that I couldn't add before, like these 76 Shermans mm -hmm. to give me that little extra AT and some extra armor. I could add M10s and support. So there's lots of really good options to support these guys. Armored Rifle is a great option to support pretty much anything. You bring one Armored Rifle platoon, that can hold you objective, it can take an objective. It's like a small army onto itself. So the Stuarts give you a nice, core to play with and the total points are quite low yeah. so yeah I, I really like the flexibility of the Stewart company and what it's going to give you of course i also like being able to bring my m8 scots and um yeah i'm just very jazzed about this particular yeah. force well I, I i'm going to go with the bog standard u.s infantry division um mm -hmm. the rifle companies uh the veteran and the fresh ones those are my i'm excited about those particular formations uh, because when I was digging in t and doing the research around the command cards, I just there's so much interesting flavor around each division, and they each have their own history. Um, and I just find it really interesting that a lot of times people consider American infantry as very bland, very generic, and on paper it is. But when you kind of dig into how they operated on the field, and and actually the the they were quite experimental. Like, for example, you mentioned the SMGs. The, the, the Second Infantry Division experimented by giving an entire company submachine guns when they were going into an urban fighting situation. Mm -hmm. That turned out to be very, very popular. And they kind of retained that as that was became their thing. The 29th Infantry Division, after Normandy, they kept all of their demolition equipment. They weren't supposed to. They, they, mm -hmm. they kept it. And they was like, yeah, no, we used it all. And they kind of held it. And when they went into Brittany to, to deal with even more fortifications, they not only had that equipment, 
still with them. But what they did is they took all of the people, all of their veterans from D-Day who stormed the Atlantic Wall, they took all of them, chose the best battalion out of the unit, and trained them specifically to, to deal with, with fortified stuff. So they, they were able to go through, they had their flamethrowers, they still had their, you know, their Bangalore torpedo explosives and all that stuff. And they went in and they just, they wrecked, they wrecked um, the German fortifications in Brittany. And what was interesting is that it wasn't just a one-off. They then took all that stuff and got approval to replenish their, um, their demolitions. And they retained that formation for the rest of the war. And they used it later on in the Siegfried line when they went into Germany. So they were, they were called up specifically to lead the way because they had uh, like fortification breaching expertise. And what was, uh, I think that's what's interesting about Normandy is it took a lot of American divisions that all look the same on paper and turned them into a very specific armored division or mm -hmm. infantry division. So they, they could do a very specific thing. So that's what I really like about the rifle company in this book, both the veteran and the, and the, and the uh, fresh one, is you build this force and then when, if you take the command card and you can swap out command cards and you get a completely different play experience just by swapping out like, okay, today I'm gonna to play the 29th Infantry Division. Grab the, grab the blue and the grays. I'm gonna play 29th Infantry Division. It means I get to do these things. And then the next day I'll wanna play, I wanna play the, um, the 30th Infantry Division that was surrounded and cut off on, in Mauritain. So I'll play that and they'll have a better like last stand rating and mm -hmm. things like that. So it means that if you want to find out, you know, you want to play a specific battle, you actually can look on a map, say, hey, that's the, you know, that's the, that's the second infantry division or the first infantry division. Let me just go grab a card and, and upgrade it. Now, having said that, I want to mention that the first infantry division and the 29th infantry division don't necessarily have their own special title. Um, because, they're the core. because they're the core units in this book. Yeah. Um, but there is, in, for the, uh, for the 29th, 29th Infantry Division, there is that demolition, there's a demolition upgrade that lets you take uh, flamethrowers with your rifle platoon. Yeah, it's, it's like a pioneer upgrade thing, yeah. yeah. Um, one thing that is um, also to mention is that if you have a force, that, like a niche force that we don't cover, the thing that's nice about those cards and these units, the way we present them in the book, is that it's really easy to represent what you want to play by just picking the cards that make sense for the unit that you want to do and say, well, actually, I'm playing this particular unit. And that's one thing I really like about the new version 4 flexibility is that um, it does give you more options. So you could theoretically build more on historical lists, but at the same time, it gives you all the tools you need to be able to like this unit, this battle. And I really like that. It just says yes to creativity. I want to, I want to just kind of talk about that just for a second, though, because one of the interesting things about Normandy, the more and more I researched it, the more and more I found out that the American army worked with the American army. Like there is no, mm -hmm. there is no wrong combination of, of forces. So, you know, Rangers working with tanks, absolutely. Rangers oh, working cool. with assault guys, absolutely. Rangers linking up with paratroopers, well, we've seen that movie. Um, <laughs> you know, these are all ones that we, that are things that are completely valid. Like I just, I don't want, I want you to uh, use your imagination um, and actually be comfortable in the fact that history has your back. You can find, if you want to, if you want to find historical justification, there's, it's going to be there. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, one thing that's also quite cool with the American Army is your fresh and veteran mm -hmm. setup as well, because it allows you just to play different variants of the same army. I paint one Sherman company up. Well, actually, I want to play veteran now, so I take a couple of them out, mm -hmm. and I have just a whole other army, a whole nother, another game experience. And this particular uh, book is very good at that, mm -hmm. doing that with both of them. All right, um, we have one more question here from Rick, mm -hmm. and he says, any chance of a new edition of the Normandy Battles book to be put into, um, let's see, put these D-Day forces to work? Well, well the, <laughs> the answer to that is absolutely. We kind of covered it a little bit. Um, we don't have a Normandy Battles book coming out, but what I've done is I've, I, we love that book. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, we just absolutely loved all the content in it. Um, what we're doing uh, is we're taking that and putting it in all of these uh, Normandy books, these D-Day these D -Day books. So if you collect the D-Day American, German, and British books, um, you're going to end up with a bunch of missions, a bunch of scenarios, well, not, maybe not scenarios, but missions, uh, command card options. Three missions per book, somewhere around there, yeah. and then a whole campaign system in each book. And there's little campaigns in all the books, things like that. So um, so yes, we haven't... We haven't um, uh, forgotten about that stuff. We really loved that book. Uh, we just wanted, and we and we made a, a 
big effort to make sure that that, that stuff was retained and in these books. If, if even if you don't collect all the books, your playgroup has all of them all. Mm. Like someone's going to be playing British, someone's going to be playing Germans, and so if you want to do a big battle or do the campaign, all the missions will be available. Mm -hmm. So not so everyone doesn't have to buy a campaign book; they just have it. The other thing we're doing is the um, DD, um, sorry, DD, did a um, ace campaign card sets, and so we're bringing back um, infantry aces and tank aces and all that stuff into this kind of new campaign system, which is a card base, something that I'm not something that uh, you're quite familiar with because yeah. you can't make it. <laughs> yeah, the, um, one of the things that I, I wanted to do was create a card based campaign system. So you'll see this come up pretty pretty shortly, though, so I'll, I'll be brief about it. But it's, it's basically a narrative-driven dr campaign. So you, you draw the first card um, and you play them. It tells you which mission to play. Um, it, t it gives you a story about the mission. And then you play the mission. You come back and let's say, let's say I won and you lost. This is fantasy after all, so <laughs> I have to make these things up. Um, uh, because I won the mission, uh, it says, it gives me a little narrative blurb about what happened. Yeah. And then and then tells me to what the next card I need to grab is to play. And so the next mission is this one because I won. Um, there was a there was a, an alternative that could have happened if you had won. Yeah. So it's kind of like a tree of like a narrative tree. So you play you play through four games and, and you do that. But the, what what we've layered on top of that is the ace campaign. So as you're playing through it, you can add in these ace cards. So um, every single mission, uh, your force commander. The guy that's leading your force uh, gets gets little upgrades. It's like, a, it's like a mini RPG campaign as well. And the thing that's cool with those cards is that you can make them as complicated as you want. You can just do just the missions. You can do it as a tournament if you want to. You can do it as a, a three oh, four, sorry a four week campaign. You can add the aces and and then you also have side missions that extend it to even longer. Yep. So you can go bigger or smaller. But on top of all that, so the books and the ace campaign, we're also doing two kind of just major campaigns. The first one is our Hobby League, which is focused on getting you into the game, building armies and doing stuff together, but there's still games and tournaments and stuff happening during that. And while that's going through, the Aces campaign is coming out, and that's also being used during the Hobby League. The D-Day train will come out, all that stuff. So the Hobby League kind of is your focus to go to your store and join in on all the stuff. So it's a good, um, a good idea to go to your local store to see if they are doing the Hobby League, see if there's any way you can plug into the community and um, join into that kind of growing, um, basically the growing V4 community for late war. The other thing after that, because feeding right out of the Hobby League, we're going straight into the on tabletop gaming campaign, which is going to be a global campaign based on the website, which you get to fight the battles in Normandy, and you can bring any army you want to, fight into the game, and then put your results online. And so as you fight, there'll be different locations you can fight over. Each of those will have different scenarios, different missions for you to play, that kind of stuff. So you're going to have a huge interactive, basically, forces in Normandy for you to join all your friends. So if you join the Hobby League, you'll have your 100 points painted by the end of it, because that's the point of the Hobby League, is that you and your friends getting together to paint your 100 points, and you'll be right into the Normandy campaign um, on the on tabletop gaming campaign. So there's Lots a lot of, of stuff. Yeah, a lot of stuff on. Uh, it's, it's exciting. I it's, love... I'm excited to see what the community comes up with, too. So yeah. keep an eye on the Facebook group and stuff. Because I, you know... You and I have talked about this constantly. I love narrative play. I love non-competitive kind of league play. And there's going to be so much of that coming up. I mean, we still have tournaments. You'll still have your competitive aspect because, you know, you, you always will. But I like having the ability to go and just have a fun game and not worry about whether or not this is going to affect a score. So you just, you just play. And it's less stress. And it's great. Yeah. Cool. All right. Is that it? That's all, that's all of our questions for today? Yeah, that's pretty much all of our questions. So I guess we'll um, just leave it at that. Um, I'm Andrew, and of course, Mike, my, yep. my brother <laughs> here. And um, we'll catch you in the next video. Cool. Thanks.